Hello, 3ABN family. I'm Jill Morricone, and we are in lesson number 13. That's right, you've stayed with us week by week as we've journeyed through the Gospel of Mark. This lesson is the risen Lord. The last two weeks were a little heavy. It's a, a painful topic sometimes as we contemplate Jesus' crucifixion and what he endured both physically and mentally for us but he did not stay in the tomb. He rose again, and we're gonna look at that this week. I wanna remind you, if you'd like your own copy of our notes, they all look different because we're all different people, but we would love to send them to you. Just email us, ssp at 3abn.org. That's ssp at 3abn.org, and we would love to sign you up for that. I wanna introduce, they don't need an introduction, but my family on the panel here, your family as well at home, Pastor James. Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled, The Stone Rolled Away. Amen. My sister in Christ, Shelley Quinn. And I'm excited to be here. I have Tuesday's lesson, The Women at the Tomb. Amen. One of my favorite singers in the whole world, evangelist and singer in Israel, Ryan. Amen. I have uh, Wednesday's lesson entitled, Appearing to Mary and Others. Amen. Last but not least, my pastor, Pastor John Lomake. And I have Go into all the world, evidence that the gospel is about to close. Amen. It's going to be a power-packed week. And before we even open up the word or study, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor James, would you pray for us? Father, just want to thank you again for this amazing study we've had in the gospel of Mark. As we close it up now, we just want to pray for our viewers and for our own hearts. We've looked specifically more recently at... Uh, the death of Christ, His great sacrifice for each and every human being on planet Earth. And as we contemplate that, we pray that each person listening and each one of us will continue to be moved and directed and our hearts open to heaven. Guide us now, send the Holy Spirit to be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we look at the risen Lord, if you were with us last week, you see that we covered Jesus' crucifixion, actually before the crucifixion, the crucifixion and then his burial. We had the veil of the temple being rent in two, type meeting anti-type, the centurion's declaration, truly, this was the son of God. The, the disciples, they're devastated. Their hearts are devastated. This week, we almost go from darkness to light. You see, the resurrection was no surprise to God because that was the plan all along. And Jesus had tried to instruct his disciples and tell them he would rise on the third day, and yet they had not comprehended or understood it. So the resurrection was a surprise to them. Have you ever questioned what you believe in? Have you ever been in the dark and longed for the light? Have you ever had a hard time believing when the light came? This week, we look at the burial of Jesus. I know we discussed it last week, but we'll cover it again in uh, brief. Then we look at evidence that Jesus rose again. And the woman and later others who saw the resurrected Savior and the Great Commission, you and I have to go and tell. Remember when we started the book of Mark, we talked about two divisions. Who is Jesus? He's the Messiah. Where is he going? He's going to the cross. Now that he's risen, you and I have the great commission to go and tell. Tell others what, who Jesus is, what he has done, and who he can be to them. Our memory text is Mark 16, verse 6. He said to them, this is the angel inside the tomb, to the woman, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Sunday, we look at that context. We're starting actually with Mark 15, verse 42. And then we go into Mark chapter 16. So let's pick it up with verse 42. Now when the evening had come, so Jesus is just crucified. He has just died on the cross. And the evening had come because it was the preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. Jesus died at the ninth hour, 3 p.m. there on Friday afternoon. All the gospel writers agree. He died on Friday. 
the preparation day. He rested on the Sabbath, as Pastor James brought out so well last week. His disciples also rested on the Sabbath. We see this if you read in Luke 23, verse 56, it says they returned and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Takeaway number one, Jesus' death did not abolish God's law. Some people claim that. Jesus' death, oh no, we're no longer under the law. Jesus came and was crucified and his death abolished that. Now his death do, did put to end, you could say, the sacrificial system, the ceremonial laws that they held. We know when that veil of the temple was rent in two and no longer were the lambs needed to be slaughtered. Be looking forward to the coming Messiah because Jesus came. His perfect life and his substitutionary death. No longer were those needed. We know that Jesus took our sin on the cross. Praise the Lord for that. Let's look at verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, he had been part of the Sanhedrin. He was part of the Sanhedrin. And John tells us he was a secret disciple of Jesus. But here at this moment, he took courage and he came out of the closet, as it were, in this sense, coming out of the closet, meaning he had been hiding who he really was. Mm. And who was he? He was actually a follower of Jesus, but he'd been afraid to make that known. Now he makes his public declaration. Take away two. Jesus' death enables other people to take a stand. I think of the early Christian martyrs. Would they have been willing to be beheaded or go to the cross or go to the stake if they did not believe in Jesus, if Jesus had not died and risen again, where would our faith be? It gives us courage and hope. You and I need to accept and internalize his sacrifice on the cross and then his subsequent resurrection. That gives you and I courage to make a stand. The next verse, verse 44. Pilate marveled, he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked of him if he'd been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Mm -hmm. As Pastor James brought out last week, takeaway three, Jesus' death was proven, not just by the disciples or by some religious sect, proven by the Roman governor and authority. Verse 46, he bought the linen. This is Joseph of Arimathea bought it. He took Jesus down wrapped him in the linen, laid him in a tomb which had been hewed out of the rock, rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. Takeaway four, following God involves sacrifice. What sacrifice did Joseph do in these couple of verses right here? There was a financial sacrifice. Now we know he's a wealthy man, so it might not have been a huge sacrifice, but he had to go out and purchase the linen. We know Nicodemus went and purchased the spices. There was an emotional sacrifice. He took Jesus down from the cross. Was there any guilt? I should have stood up for him sooner. Was there any pain? I love this man, he's the son of God and, and look how badly he's been beaten and bruised and now he's dead. It was an emotional sacrifice. There was a time sacrifice. He's a busy man. He's taking hours of his time to buy the linen and to wrap Jesus. There was a personal sacrifice because he laid him in his own tomb. Mm -hmm. We learned that from Matthew. It was Joseph's own tomb and it was new. There was also a physical sacrifice because they rolled the stone across the door of the tomb. And Matthew says it was a big stone. It was a difficult, there's a physical sacrifice. Following Jesus involves sacrifice. And sometimes for you and I, it's financial or personal or emotional or any one of these. Now in chapter 16, we see the three women go to the tomb. The three women were mentioned being there present when Jesus died. And now we see the same three women Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome going to the tomb. It says very early on Sunday morning, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And what happened? The stones rolled away. There's an angel inside. And what did they say in verse six? The angel says to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. 
see the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. Let's stop there just for a moment. Remember we studied in previous weeks, Peter denying Jesus. Peter having said that he would do anything for, P, for Jesus. Mm. And yet when it, the rubber met the road and people started criticizing Peter and ridiculing, what happened? He denied Jesus, his Lord and Master and Savior. So I just love how God is so gentle with us. The, the angels knew that Peter's beaten himself up all weekend. He's feeling horrible. There's repentance and true conversion going on. And go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you'll see him as he said to you. Takeaway number five, following Jesus involves testifying. The angel testified to the woman. What did they say? He is risen. He's not here. The women were to testify to the disciples and Peter. Anytime you and I find Jesus, anytime we experience him and are truly converted, we cannot help but testify of his goodness and his grace and his power. Now, many Christians beginning probably second century AD began to say Jesus was resurrected on Sunday. Therefore, we need to be keeping Sunday as holy, not recognizing that Jesus rested on Sabbath in the tomb, that the disciples rested and that Jesus' resurrection did not abolish, did not alter or change the law of God. In fact, it's amazing to me when you read the New Testament. You see the symbolism of baptism that Pastor John talked about in our previous lesson. And we see the correlation, you could say, between when we're baptized, the burial into the water, bearing with like with Christ into that death. And then that resurrection rising out of the water, rising to walk in newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4 says it this way. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God, you and I, even so, should walk in newness of life. Okay. Colossians 2 verse 12 says it almost the same way. We were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You see, because Jesus was raised, our hope is not vain. That is true. Because Jesus was raised, you and I have hope of eternal life. That is true. But also because Jesus was raised, you and I can experience transformation of character. You and I can experience the resurrection power of God in our lives through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We have hope not just in the resurrection, but hope of transformation of character. Takeaway six, following Jesus involves transformation. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill. That is so powerful. It is amazing, really, when you think about the idea that when the disciples laid the body of Christ in the tomb, they rested on the seventh day according to the commandment. It's right there in the context. My name is uh, James Rafferty. I have Monday's lesson. It's entitled The Stone Rolled Away. What we're doing in this lesson is we're comparing Mark 16, 1 through 8 with 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. So Mark 16, 1 through 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. And we're going to see what these passages have in common. Let's begin in Mark 16, 1 through 8, really just reiterating this beautiful uh, picture of the empty tomb, the stone rolled away and the empty tomb. When Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. So right after Christ is laid in the tomb, they rest according to the, for, the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, and then they come back early Sunday morning. As the sun is beginning to rise, they come back because they want to finish the preparation for his burial. They want to finish dealing with his body and the sweet spices. And as they come, verse two says, very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun and they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? You know, sometimes 
the stones, the obstacles that we need removed, that we worry about, that we focus on, that we think about, by the time we get to them, God has already taken care of them. And that's what we find here with these ladies, these sisters, as they come to uh, anoint the body of Christ. They found, verse 4, when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very great. So sometimes the troubles we worry about, God takes care of them before we even get to them, right? And the entering the sepulcher, they saw a young man see on the right side. So the, the one obstacle is gone, but now there's another problem that they're facing, and that is the tomb is empty. They think it's a problem. The tomb is empty <laughs> is a, a problem they think they have, but it really isn't a problem at all. There's a, a young man seen on the right side. He's clothed with a long white garment, and they're frightened. They're afraid. And he says unto them, don't be frightened. Don't be afraid. I love this because over and over again in the Bible, we have this assurance that comes to us. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I've got this. You need to focus on me. Don't focus on the problem or the problem you think you have. So many times as believers, we think we have a problem that turns into a blessing. And that's what we're going to see here in this situation. Their supposed problem actually becomes a blessing to them. The greatest blessing to ever come upon the human race. Amen. The blessing of an empty tomb. Jesus Christ is resurrected. And he said unto them, don't be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified, yes, but he is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Go your way. Tell his disciples, verse 7, and Peter, that he goes before you into Galilee. There you shall see him as he said unto you. Now, they can hardly believe this because if you remember, they have all forsaken Christ. Maybe not the women, but the message that they're giving to the disciples is that, that these disciples are to meet Christ. He's going to go before them to Galilee. They have forsaken him. And Jesus knew this in Matthew 26's account. It says that Jesus told them, you're going to deny me, but I'm not going to deny you. You're going to leave me, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to go before you to Galilee. He gives them the assurance of his love and acceptance even before they forsake him. And this is the message of the gospel. God has taken care of our sin problem. Jesus Christ has died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He has taken care of the sin problem even before we're believers, while we were ungodly, while we were enemies of God, Romans chapter 5 tells us. And so they quickly... They go out, verse 8, they fled from the sepulcher, for they were trembling and amazed, and they said, and, and said that, and neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the implications of this? This is the best news in the world. This is the gospel. This is the foundation of the gospel. And we'll see that as we look at the verses we're going to compare with in 1 Corinthians 15. And they're afraid to preach it. They're afraid to say it. And even as they start saying it to the disciples, the supposedly the ones who followed Christ for three and a half years, the ones who believed in Him, as they begin to say it to them, they don't even believe it. Mm -hmm. They think it's foolishness. They think it's crazy. These, these ladies, there's something wrong with these, with these girls. They, they, there's something wrong with their minds. We need to straighten them out, <laughs> right? This is how the gospel starts. And you can imagine, you know, God, the whole of the unfallen world looking down, just looking down and going, man, if this is the way it's going to start, how are we going to end this thing? Mm -hmm. But Jesus Christ, the faith of Jesus Christ in His disciples is unshakable, right? Yes. He's going to go before them. He's going to meet them. He's going to gird them for the, the conflict ahead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 8. Let's look at these verses. I love these verses because these verses come from Paul, who was an apostle called out of time. You know, the disciples, when they lost Judas, they put him at this. And we never hear from him again. But when you look at uh, the, the big picture here, I think Paul is the one that God actually calls because Jesus called all of the 12 disciples except for Judas. Judas kind of called himself, if you look at, uh, compare the Gospels, but Jesus did call Paul, mm -hmm. right? Personally, individually, he called Paul. So Paul, in my mind, will be that 12th apostle that's there in the foundation of the city of God. You know, the names of the 12 apostles are there. Mm -hmm. I believe Paul's going to be one of them. Moreover, brethren, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you and which also you've received and wherein you stand, by which also you were saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you believed in vain. This is powerful because when you look at this, what we're realizing here is that by this time, by the time Paul's preaching the gospel, it's something that they, that they believe. It's something that, that, that's been declared to them. It's something they keep in memory. It's something that, that is the foundation of 
of their experience. It's not something they're afraid of. It's not th something they're shocked by. It's not something that they don't know what to do with it, that they're amazed about. It's something that actually lays the foundation for everything else that comes. For I deliver unto you, verse 3, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, verse 4, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And there's no embarrassment here, is there? These guys are full on. Paul is full on right now. He is all about the gospel. Why? Because it's the foundation. And the first of all of the gospel, because really the gospel is the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But there's a first of all. You have to start somewhere. What's the basic foundation of the gospel? It's the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the foundation. The everlasting gospel. Revelation 14 calls us to the everlasting gospel. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of that everlasting gospel and everything else goes out from that. Mm -hmm. Once we have that gospel, we have everything we need to embrace all of the light that God wants to, wants to give us. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12, verse five, and then verse six. After that, he was seen above, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain of this present, but some are fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. And the last of all, he was seen of me also, verse 8, as of one born out of time. Why is Paul mentioning all the different people that saw Jesus resurrected? Because it's part of the evidence for the foundation mm -hmm. of the gospel. See, the story of the resurrection appears in each one of the gospels. The gospel writers present the story from different perspectives, and even Paul has a different perspective, but they all contain the core concepts that appear here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Four ideas appear again and again and again. Died, buried, risen, and seen. Died, buried, risen, and seen. So in Mark, the died, buried uh, are in chapter 15. The risen and the seen are in chapter 16, as we talked about with the women. But with a twist. In Mark 16, verse 7, it speaks of meeting in Galilee. There you will see him. And of course, that's confirmed in John chapter 21. Now, some people find it incredible that Christians believe in a risen Lord, but the evidence for his resurrection is substantial and consistent with reason. Number one, for starters, all one has to do is believe in God as a creator. If you believe in God as a creator, then resurrection isn't impossible. I mean, God created the world out of nothing. So, so resurrection is reasonable when you believe in a creator God. Next, the tomb was definitely empty. Right? Even atheist historians accept that fact. And if we're not, the claim about the resurrection would fall right from the beginning. It would just end. Resurrection, what are you talking about? There's this tomb right there and there's the body. <laughs> that would have ended right there, but it didn't. And number three, the explanation that his disciples stole the body doesn't work. Right? Because the disciples couldn't have gotten past the guards. There's no way they could have gotten past the Romans. Mm -hmm. they would have, it would have been impossible for them to get to that body. And then also, numerous people testified to the risen Christ. So you've got all of these witnesses. And then finally, how does one explain the rise of the Christian church? Mm -hmm. Founded by people who claim to see, have seen a risen Lord. People who are willing to die mm -hmm. for that claim. If it was a lie, willing to die for a lie? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. So there we have the evidence, the foundation of the everlasting gospel, Revelation chapter 14. It's time to reclaim it. Amen. Thank you, Pastor James, so much. He is risen. We can base our faith on that. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a short break and be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three of you in Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to our study on the risen Lord. I want to turn it over to Miss Shelley Quinn. Oh, I'm blessed to have Tuesday, the women at the two. A personal testimony. The worst year of my life, absolutely the worst, turned out to be the best year of my life. Mm -hmm. That's what God can do. He really taught me on a personal level and it turned out to be a life-changing year. We're going to look 
at the women who watched Jesus, the crucifixion. It was the worst day of their life, but it's going to become the best. We're looking at Mark 16, 1 through 8, beginning in Mark 16, verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, so this is after the hours of the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. If we look at the Gospel of John 19 and 25, he reveals or identifies at least four women who witnessed the crucifixion. There was Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary's sister, which was probably Salome, who was married to Zebedee and the mother of James and John. Then there was Mary, the wife of Cleopas. She's the mother of James the Younger and Joseph. And then Mary Magdalene. So get this picture. We're talking about what Jesus went through. Here are these women watching in abject horror as they see the one they love, their Lord is hanging between heaven and earth, gasping, struggling to breathe. They are witnessing his death. They see the Roman soldier thrust the spear through his side. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Can you begin mm -hmm. to imagine that experience? They hear his words, it is finished. To them, it's over. Mm -hmm. They don't realize Jesus is speaking of his earthly ministry and that he will be resurrected to continue a ministry as our high priest in heaven. So Friday afternoon, their hope was trampled and they watched as his body was removed from the cross and laid in the tomb. Mark 15, 47 said, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. The Jews did not embalm their dead. They wrapped them in perfumed cloths. So the women are anxious to show their love and respect for Jesus. Oh, they're, they're watching where he's been laid and now they're gonna go home. They want to prepare spices and they do. They prepare the spices they have at home already before the Sabbath begins. But then it says in verse in Luke 23, 56, they returned and prepared spices and fragrance oils. And what do they do? They rest mm -hmm. on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Oh, how obvious it is that Jesus never said anything about changing the Ten Commandments about changing mm -hmm. the, if he were going, he wrote those with his own finger on stone. If he were going to change that commandment, he would have shouted it from the rooftop. So here's what's happening. They prepare the few spices they have on hand. Now they rest. How much rest do you think they got on that Sabbath? I don't imagine it was a very restful refreshing Sabbath for them. Can you imagine the women through the night and, and through the day, they're sighing, they're mm -hmm. crying, their hearts feel crushed. Mm -hmm. They've watched their loved one be killed. They are distressed, discouraged, depressed, just the horror of the events. They couldn't shake the image of his broken and bruised body that was on the cross. So now it's interesting to me because I don't think I've ever really paid attention to this. Mark says, we just read it, Mark 16, 1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome, they go and buy some more spices. Mm -hmm. They yeah. want to get everything prepared. And then very early Sunday morning, they go out to the tomb to perform this labor of love. You know, they weren't expecting him to be gone. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand the resurrection. Mm 
They forgot the words that Jesus said in John 16, 22. I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and you, your joy no one will take from you. Those words were blurred by the horror they had seen. So we see John chapter 20 and verse 1 said that Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb first. So she, it was still dark. Possibly she slipped out from the rest of the women and went out there by herself. But now let's continue in Mark 16 and verse 3. They said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? So you can see them walking along and they've got their spices, their hearts are heavy. And then they're, suddenly somebody says, oh, we saw them roll that heavy stone. Who's going to roll it away? They didn't know it had been sealed. They didn't know that a guard had been posted. All they know is a heavy stone. And, and they're like, there's no men with us. That thing's heavy. What's going to happen? But when they get there, it says verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. You know what? The stone wasn't rolled away just to let Jesus out. It was to let the witnesses in. And so entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. They were met by an angel. Mark, uh, Luke records two angels, but Mark is focusing on the angel who speaks to them and tells them the marvelous truth of the gospel that we serve a living Savior. Mark 16, he, the angel, said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter that, the, that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. And as he said to you, so they went out quickly. They fled from the tomb. They trembled. They were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So what it's saying here, they're overwhelmed by the angel's presence. And for the first little while, they couldn't even speak about it. We read in the, gar uh, in the gospel that when Mark starts his gospel, we know from the beginning Jesus is the Messiah. And halfway through the book, then Peter proclaims that he is Messiah. But Jesus protected his identity so that he could complete his ministry according to the timelines of Daniel. Mark 1, he tells the leper, tell no one of your healing. Mark 5, 43, tell Jairus and his wife, tell no one that I raised your daughter. Mark 7, 36, he tells a group to, uh, not to tell people about his healing of a deaf and mute man. Mark 8 and verse 30 and 9 and 9, commands his disciples not to tell that he is the Messiah. Now the women know he's resurrected from the dead and they're amazed and they're fearful and they flee the tomb and they don't speak at first, but their silence didn't last long. Mm -hmm. Listen to Mark 16, 20. They went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. This shatters the motif of the secrecy that, and being silent about what Jesus had done. 1 Peter 3, 15 says this, we can't be quiet about what God has done. It says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that he is in you with meekness and fear. We are God's ambassadors. We are imploring, as it were, on behalf of Jesus Christ, be reconciled to God. We are to be a letter written on the heart but we are to go out and tell the world, Jesus is risen. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love it. I love it. I'm Ryan Day. I have uh, Wednesday's lesson entitled, Appearing to Mary and Others. And uh, we're going to be jumping right into Mark chapter 16. And we're going to read verses 9 through 20. 
And I'm going to make some, some comments along the way as we go here, because as I was reading through this passage, uh, several other things come to my mind as I was building this lesson. And I want to share them with you that I think will be helpful as well. So we're going to start with verse 9 in Mark chapter 16. It says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him, and they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Notice how this theme keeps coming up. After that, he appeared in another form to two men. We know these two men to be the ones on the road to Emmaus there in Luke 24. He appeared uh, uh, in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. And uh, this is just fascinating to me. Again, I'm not certainly going to place myself here as if I was living in this time and I would also believe. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we would probably, having been faced with a lot, all of the challenges and the humanity and the challenges they had at that time, who knows, we probably would have been in disbelief also. Uh, but I do find this to be interesting. My mind went back to that occasion in uh, Acts chapter 12, where Peter was in prison. And, uh, and it says that the church was in prayer for him. And then the, the, they, the Lord answered their prayer, sent an angel, bust them out of jail. He shows up at, at his family's door. In fact, it was Mark's mom's house, the, Mark, the writer of this gospel. It was John Mark's mom's house where there, where there was a group of Christians there in active prayer at that moment, praying for Peter. He comes and knocks on the door. Little girl answers the door and says, oh, Peter's outside, <laughs> Peter's outside. And, and the Bible says that they all did not believe that it was him. Oh, you know, it can't be him. And, and, and just remind him as I was reading this through how often our, our prayer experiences or, or our prayer meetings may be. And, and even these similar situations when we are faced with, with, uh, with things where God wants us to believe. He wants us to believe in his power. He wants us to believe in his word. How often do we question even his word and are in disbelief of the very word of God that has been delivered to us. And so I, I couldn't help but my mind to go there just to see that there's all of these people coming and saying, we've seen Jesus, we've seen Jesus, we've seen Jesus. And the rest of them are like, no, you didn't. No, there's no way. He, he's, he's dead. Mm. Uh, verse 14 in uh, Mark chapter 16, it says, Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And, uh, and, and again, I just put a, put a note here. How often is the Lord's work halted or prevented due to disbelief? Sometimes God's work cannot move forward and be as successful as it could or it should because of our own disbelief in what he can and will do if we simply just believe and trust in him. And then, of course, we have here in uh, verse 15 here, it says it transitions into the Great Commission. It's interesting because Mark, again, we know this is a very fast gospel. He's kind of hitting the fast forward button and he's going through and he's hitting all the high points. So it transitions into the Great Commission. And it says here, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then notice again, we come back to the same thing. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And I just want to highlight here this word that keeps appearing, not just in the gospel of Mark and not specifically just in this chapter, although it appears many times in this chapter. Um, this word believe that appears often all throughout the gospels uh, in the original Greek, it's the word pistuo, which we when you really dig deeper and try to understand what does it mean to believe? Obviously, the Bible says that the devil and his demons believe and tremble, right? And so it's not simply just a mental acceptance of, you know what? I know Jesus is my Savior and I know he died on the cross for my sin and I know he rose on the third day. It's much more than that. Jesus says, I don't want you to just believe that those things happened or just believe that I am a real person and that I truly did die on the cross for your sins. Jesus wants you to take it further. And that's what he's requiring here. This belief, this pistuo in the original Greek, it means to fully put faith in, to fully put trust in his word and what he says that he will do. And so it means to fully trust. That's really what it means to have so much of a strong faith that you bank all and you root and ground all that you are and everything that you are and have been and you can be into 
do Jesus Christ because you believe in what he can do for you. And so this again brought me back to John chapter 20, which is the same parallel. Remember, it says he met with the 11. Uh, John chapter 20, I love this, this passage here because the encounter he has with Thomas. When the others told Thomas that he was risen, Thomas says, I, I, I'm sorry. Again, here comes Mary and the women. Then you got the two from the, on the road from to Emmaus. And then you have now the, uh, the, the other disciples, the other 10 disciples are saying, hey, Jesus, Jesus is resurrected. He's alive. And even, even after all of this amazing testimony, Thomas still says, unless I see it with my own eyes, unless I feel it, it, it hit the, 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 the stab in the side or the wound in the side, and I feel the marks in his hands. Notice what it says here in John 20, verses 24 to 29. Now, Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Strong words. It says in verse 26 of John 20, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. So by the way, this is, this is uh, eight days into that 40 days between the time that he was resurrected and the time of course uh, that Jesus is going to ascend. So Jesus waited eight days to have his encounter with Thomas. And it says here, and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger in here. I love that. <laughs> it's so simple. Reach your finger in here. I can just imagine. Reach your finger in here and look at my hands and reach your hand in here and put it into my side. Mm -hmm. But he says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. In other words, I could, I could just imagine Jesus saying in his own way, Thomas, when are you going to learn to trust me? When are you going to learn to trust my word, Thomas? When are you going to be truly believe and have faith in the word that I have given you? And then verse 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, Jesus uh, said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's powerful. That's powerful. M many of us, we can say we've never seen Jesus in person. We've never seen the miracles that he, he done in those days. We've never heard his audible voice. But you know, the blessing that we can say is that, you know, even though we haven't, uh, you know, uh, in, in a very tangible way experienced those things that we read about in scripture, blessed are we who believe and trust in Jesus Christ and his word, even in these times. I just want to transition now to a portion of the lesson uh, where it actually brings us out back to the women. I love this, what she wrote here, or what the, what the author wrote here, not she, but he wrote here. It says, the first person to see Jesus alive was Mary Magdalene. Other women saw him as well. It is significant that the first people to see the risen Lord were women. That's significant. Wow. Because women in the ancient world did not have high status as witnesses. If the story were fabricated, it would have been much more likely to name men as the first witnesses. But it is not men. Uh, it's, it's not the 12, but a woman. She goes to tell the good news to the disciples. But not surprisingly, they do not believe her testimony, most likely because it seemed fanatic. And also, unfortunately, because Mary was a woman. It goes on to say, apologists for the resurrection story of Jesus have used this fact that of women, Women being the first ones to have seen Jesus as powerful evidence for the veracity of the story. You know, I can, I can say that according to that, the Pharisaical traditions of the day, Jesus was a rebel. Not because he wanted to be a rebel, but, but he challenged them. Like, for instance, he called a tax collector. Who does that, right? That was against their rules. He, he broke their man-made traditional Sabbath laws. Um, he addressed their prejudices. He sat with Gentiles. He gave salvation to the Gentiles. He touched lepers and unclean people. He ate with, uh, with what they called undefiled hands, even though he didn't. And of course, all of, he, all of these different things. And now he's calling women to be the first witnesses of the gospel. Jesus is breaking all the rules of the day. But yet at the same time, he's trying to break down those traditional thoughts that are not in harmony of his. It goes on to say, of course, if they were making the story up, why would they have made themselves look so bad? I love that. It goes right along with what Pastor was saying. Jesus made it all very clear. He used the, the 
most uh, uh, uncommon scenarios and people and, and, and to bring about this truth, why would they all go and die uh, for such a lie? I want to just back that up. It's a powerful story indeed. And it's powerful to see that Jesus used these women to, to proclaim. And there's an old song. It goes, Mary was the first one to carry the gospel. I love that song because it's true that she was the first one to tell of the risen Savior. Amen, Ryan. Thank you. Wow. The woman in Genesis, the woman at the tomb, the woman in Revelation. There's some cadence to that. Praise God. And now we end with go into all the world. This is the, the, the climax of the ages, the, the cadence that has been carried on from generation to generation, from the garden to the second coming of Jesus. The gospel has been resonated in every generation to every nation, every kindred, every tongue and every people. And, and Titus says the the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So no one would stand in the, in the presence of Christ on the day that he returns and say, I did not know. The grace of God has appeared to all men in some fashion or the other. And um, so we start in Mark chapter 16, verse 14 to 20. And I'm not going to cover all of those. I'm just going to focus on verses 15 and then verse 16 and 17. It says, um, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, he was rebuking the unbelief of the disciples there. Then he says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And then verse 17 talks about the signs that will follow them. And he talks about speaking with new tongues. And I want to make a very quick emphasis on that. He didn't say speaking with tongues. They were already speaking with tongues. They were Galileans. They had a tongue already, but they were now speaking in other tongues, as the Bible says, new tongues, the tongues of the nations around them. The point of the matter is the gospel is never intended to confuse, but to clarify. Amen. So I want to bring up some very important points. The evidence that the gospel is now building to a crescendo. I never say the gospel is ending because throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, we'll be learning something more about the gospel. It is a never ending lesson. The evidence that the gospel is going to crescendo is Matthew chapter 22, verse 32 and 33. Look at this. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that the summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near even at the door. The evidence that the gospel is about to crescendo is these are days filled with bad news. However, these are days of war and international conflict. These are days of terror and fearful signs. These are days of economic instability and political uncertainty. All the evidence of the of the coming of the Lord. These are the days of broken marriages and crumbling families. Mm. These are the days of doctrinal controversies and religious deception. These are the days when the world is changing for the worse. And the evidence that the Lord is coming soon is sign number one the rejection of the evidence. Look at 2 Peter 3, verse 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Let me put a pin in that. Things have changed from the time I was born time I went to school, things have changed over the last 10 years mm -hmm. and they're changing rapidly. We're living in a changing climate, but those who are living in this climate are rejecting the evidence. I know the summer is near because the evidence is abundant. I know that Jesus is on his way because the evidence is abundant. But Peter says they willingly forget. There's not a lack of evidence. They just choose not to believe it. So when you think about it, Jesus also has not delayed his coming. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, verse 37, because some people say the Lord delays his coming. No, no, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So it may appear as though he's forgotten, but he hasn't forgotten all of the signs that he has foretold of his soon coming will be fulfilled before he comes. The evidence is in, in the book Evangelism, page 704, paragraph one, we are told angels are now restraining the winds of strife until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels loose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as no pen can picture. I always think about that, man, what is it going to be like? And oh. I showed you something that's just a slight evidence of that. So the evidence that Jesus is coming soon is the rejection of evidence. The second sign is legislated immorality. 
think about that for a moment. Legislated immorality. Luke 17, verse 28 and 29. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. We're living in the days of legislated immorality. What does that mean? Romans 1, verse 26 and 27. These are unmistakable signs of the return of Jesus. If you see the signs of Lot's day appearing again, it is evidence that the coming of the Lord is near. What did he say? Romans 1, verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is due. Do you see that today? Legislated immorality, a sign that we're living in the last days. And so if speaking out against prevailing iniquity brings persecution, I'd rather be prosecuted by man. I'd rather be persecuted by man than prosecuted by God. The third sign is orchestrated degradation. Look at John 3, verse 19. Orchestrated degradation. Another word for degradation is orchestrated darkness. John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. And here's the reason, because their deeds are evil. Now think about that for a moment. We're living in the day and age where darkness is orchestrated. Hollywood is trying to get our eyes adjusted to the darkness. Mm. My appeal to you is don't allow your eyes to get ajar, ad, adjusted to the darkness. Pray that your eyes become accustomed to the light mm. because we're living in the days, the Bible says Isaiah 60 verse two, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness or deep darkness the people. Yeah. But what about us? But the Lord shall arise over you and his glory shall be seen upon you. Do not allow your eyes and your mind and your life to get adjusted to the darkness. Mm -hmm. God calls us to be children of light in a generation of darkness. And look what David said in Psalm 101, verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the works of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. What does he mean by that? He says, I see things, but I'm not going to let it cling to me. Mm -hmm. It's hard to walk around the streets of these worlds today, of this world today, and not see things. But he says, don't let it cling to you. You might see it, but don't, oh, don't go back. Don't let it cling to you because there are certain things that would be burned in your mind that you wish you never saw. David said, don't let it cling to you. The, the fourth sign is rejection of truth. This is the generation that supports doctrinal, doctrinal, well, let me just put it this way, a lack of doctrinal integrity. And this is the generation that determines what they believe by movies. Think about it. Somebody told me about the movie Noah. Mm. And I asked, well, what was, what was, you know, anytime a movie comes out, they said, you should go see it. I said, what was it like? They said, it made Noah look like he was angry and fighting with God and Noah had many wives. I said, that's not scriptural. But those that don't believe the Bible or read the Bible, they determine what the Bible teaches by movies like the Ten Commandments is not scripturally accurate. Mm. The Passion of the Christ is not scripturally accurate. The Resurrection, there's another move about that, is heaven for real, dying and going to heaven and coming back. That's not doctrinally clear. The rapture, that's not scripturally clear. Mm -hmm. But so many people would rather look at a movie than read the word of God. Mm -hmm. That's why they are in darkness. But what's behind it? Second Thessalonians 2 verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And then God will send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie. Do not allow your eyes to get adjusted to the darkness. Sign number five, quickly, dismantling of Protestantism. We're living in a day and age where it's hard to find Protestants. You hear evangelicals and atheists, but Protestants are those who still believe in a thus saith the Lord, undiluted, thus saith the Lord. But the Bible says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 3. And finally... The last sign, the assurance of the victory of the gospel. 
That's the good things. A lot of bad things, but there's some good stuff there. Mm -hmm. The assurance of the victory of the gospel. The gospel is not going to end. It is going to meet its crescendo in the coming of the Lord. You see, we've been preaching about the risen word. We've been preaching about the word that walked the earth, but one day we're going to see the living word. That's the crescendo of the gospel. Yeah. And what is the assurance? Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. That's blessed assurance. But who's going to do the work? Romans 9, verse 28. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Is Jesus coming? The evidence is clear. Don't close your eyes. The time for his return is near. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor John and Ryan and Shelley and Pastor James. Love studying the Word of God together and gleaning insights. So thank you all so much. Want to give you each a moment to share a closing thought. Just a closing thought in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, it says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It's only as we understand the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that we are going to be willing to die ourselves because that death has already taken place and we will not love our lives unto the death because we have the hope of the resurrection. Amen and amen. You know, I think about the women that... that Sabbath that they spent after Jesus' crucifixion. How, how tumultuous it must have been. And here this is the worst experience of their, life, of their life, but they go to the tomb and they find out the Lord is risen and it becomes the best day of their life. Likewise, as he did for them, he did for me. Worst year of my life mm. became the best year of my life because I truly came to understand the love of my risen Lord. He can do the same for you. Mm. Amen. Amen. We've learned that it's essential for us to truly believe, that is to have faith and put trust fully in Jesus Christ and his word. Uh, and so I'll just leave you. I hope all of our prayer can be that of the father that we see there uh, pleading with Jesus in Mark chapter nine, verse 24, when he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Amen. And in this hour of descending darkness, it is high time to get back to the light. In this hour of moral corruption, it is time to get back to holiness. In this hour of rejected truth, it's time to get back to the Word. Amen. Here at 3ABN, we believe in spending time in the Word of God. We believe in proclaiming the undiluted three angels' messages to a lost and dying world. We believe in you joining hands together with us here at 3ABN and helping to proclaim that gospel. Thank you for being part of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. And next week, we start a brand new quarter. Sometimes people say it's all done, but it's not. There's another 13 weeks coming next quarter, we're going from the Gospel of Mark to studying the Gospel of John. Such incredible truths we would discover, so join us next week.